Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Milliard. I'm executive editor of Healthcare IT News. Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Malik Prohit, who is the Ch clinical information lead for transformation at University Hospitals in Cleveland. Welcome, Dr. Prohit. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So we're here today to talk about some of the opportunities and some of the challenges for precision medicine, for personalized medicine, for genomics. Uh, you know, before we get into that, perhaps just a bit about yourself and, and, and what you do at, at University Hospitals. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So I have... Um... From the IT side, I have two, uh, two titles, and I'll sort of connect them in a second. One is the Associate Chief Medical Information Officer uh, for acute care, uh, meaning our uh, inpatient, which includes our hospital-based clinics, as well as uh, ED and other, other areas. And then uh, Clinical Innovation Lead for Transformation. Um, so helping our Chief Clinical Transformation Officer uh, do uh, value-based care, ACO, and other things, really advance our organization in so many ways. And so the way I describe it is in one sentence is I help implement the technology, but then leverage it as well for organizational goals. Precision medicine is, is an area, obviously, that has a lot of promise. Uh, it's, yeah. it's doing very well at some of the larger academic medical centers, perhaps not quite, you know, within the skill set of, of garden, more garden variety hospitals, but uh, it, it's got an immense amount of promise, but there are some challenges. What's the state of, of precision medicine there at university hospitals? And what are some uh, interesting projects you have going, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. And precision medicine is a very broad topic, and it can you know, include anything from genomics to AI and, and beyond. And depending on who you're speaking with, the definition changes, right? Uh, but uh, precision medicine, um, the way we've been approaching it, which is separate from our AI and other initiatives, is more on the genetic testing and then using that genomics for patient care. And so we have, um, with a partnership, but to be precise, uh, been doing that for a number of years and are starting to advance that in, in many areas, cancer care, um, PGX, meaning pharmacogenomics, uh, and then other areas, uh, uh, labor and delivery and, other, and uh, pediatrics, uh, hopefully in the next uh, 12 months as well. Um, and so there's many, certainly many challenges, but the potential is, is immense uh, for patients. One of those challenges, as we know, is um, you know the the, the deal of, of getting of data integration, of getting a genomic information into the EHR, and not just having it be you know a PDF attachment, but actually have you know <laughs> this discrete data that you can use as as clinical decision support. Um, I, I know you know to be precise helps with with that, um, but talk about how you've been managing that challenge. Yeah, and uh, that's that's a huge challenge. It's been one of the first pieces of it. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll just walk through some of the, the entry points of challenges for people. Please. So one is that is one is um, the access to the test itself, right? In terms of who's going to support it, the cost, uh, that aspect of it. Uh, and then the next aspect is once you get the test, ordering it within the EMR workflow, uh, sending it out to a reference lab, having them process the, the sample to bring it back to you. And then the part you alluded to, which is how do you get the data back in a usual manner? Um, PDF, uh, which is a lot of doc, you know, the document format that most of us are used to, and it's readable by human, but it's not easily readable by computer. Uh, and it reads it as an image rather than reading actually the text within it. Right. And so, um, and I say that not, you're an educated audience, but just in case uh, others are wondering. And so then taking that and, and putting that into an EMR where it's discrete or structured data, uh, that, uh, can be usable by uh, the algorithms and other things to process the data and make it uh, meaningful for the clinician. And then that's the other part of it is uh, meaningful for an expert genomics um, clinician versus the standard uh, physician who's looking at it for patient purposes. And, and that's uh, two levels of expertise. And so putting that in that context. And so with the help of our, our partner, to be precise, we're having the IT lift of that coming into um, our EMR with all scripts and then converting that to a usable format. And so there's a lot of backend working on that to do that, but then we're able to take that data, convert it to a usable format and put it in the workflow of the uh, clinician. Um, and talk about, uh, you know, those workflows. Um, the clinicians, you know, even the smartest physician, you know, might not be familiar with some of this stuff. And that's a whole other, you know, when it comes to education, um, what are, are, are we getting closer to having kind of, you know, precision medicine be, be part of the standard of care uh, when it comes to um, providing um, effective treatment for, for patients? And, and what are some keys to kind of, you know, ensuring that that is part of the decision-making process as, as, as care is delivered? Yeah, I hope so. I think precision medicine, this is where the immense potential is. 
is because we all are unique, right? And I think we have, as much as we are common, we're also unique in our response to medications, our response to treatments, et cetera. And this is sort of the way I look at precision medicine is our step way into personalized medicine. And how do we do that for, for each individual patient? Uh, and so I'll give one quick example is, let's say you have um, a diagnosis of depression and you need medication for that. Uh, well, there's medications called SSRIs or ser uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Fancy term, but really it's a uh, medication that helps with the serotonin levels in the brain. But all of us metabolize each different medication separate, uh, metabolize them differently, metabolize them at different uh, time points, et cetera. And then some work better for some people versus others. Right now, the only method traditionally to use that is, let me try one SSI for you. If it works for Mr. Miller, great. If it works for Moloch World, great. Uh, if it doesn't, we're going to wait six, seven weeks, increase the dose, get it to its full capacity, then switch agents, do that with another agent, and then go to a third agent. And that might take a whole year, year and a half to get through finding a treatment that may potentially work. Whereas now with precision medicine, up front, we can have your genetic data, know that what you have in your genetic profile says that you're going to metabolize this at an X rate or Y rate eliminate that some of that trial and error and get to a better treatment or the most optimal treatment for that patient in a much faster way. So you, you mentioned patients earlier. Um, talk about some of the challenges of, of communicating this stuff to patients. I mean, if, if doctors need education on some of these topics, patients undoubtedly to, yeah. to do too. I mean, I, mean, I know there's genetic counselors and you know, there's, there's a whole new kind of line of work emerging to help um, make sense of some of this stuff for patients. And how are you guys doing it? Yeah, great question. Education is a huge part of this um, and for everybody, right? Because this is new technology and uh, many people have been practiced for, you know, five, 10 or, or more years. Um, this is new technology and it's good. I mean, it's, we're developing, evolving, getting better medication, better treatment, uh, better methods of evaluating and doing things. Um, but then the other part of that is make sure that we educate all of our uh, people involved in healthcare to make sure that they're on the same page, um, both consumers and providers alike. And so in that sense, um, you know, one of the things we started, uh, and this is not specific to precision medicine, but in general about data and how to use data in real time decision making. Um, we started a, a data course at our institution. I, I co-partner with one of our professors at Case, and she and I created this course called Data for Decision Making uh, and Action. And the idea is that, you know, a lot of us are used to traditional data analytics and using that in research studies or thinking about patients. And now with the concept of precision medicine and AI and taking those at a population level and applying that to the individual patient, um, you have to think about it differently, right? Probabilistic thinking, meaning that you don't know definitively whether this test or this test will mean this thing for the patient. But what you're saying is it may mean 75% chances of X or 20% of Y. So how do you think about that and know that even if you say that it's not a slam dunk, right? 75% means there's still a 25% chance that something else may happen. And so thinking about that in the manner of probability rather than definitive, um, and then communicating that to the patient. And so we've started, we've developed this course, we've had one semester, great response, and we're gonna continue that for all of our providers and others to get that knowledge so that uh, it's a way of thinking in the modern world with the data we have. And then we have to do the same for patients. And it's a little bit different explaining for patients. They don't necessarily need to know all the nuances and details. That's why they come to us is for that advice. Um, but then explaining to them saying that we're going to personalize this for you. Here's a test that's going to tell me a lot more about you so that then I can match who you are to this treatment in the best way. And there's ways of doing that, right? But I think, and, and our audience is getting smarter all the time. And, you know, with Google, there's the pros and cons of Google. But there is a pro of it in that people do use Google and learn about it. And so we can send them to resources and have that availability for them. What do you see when you look into the near term future? I mean, traditionally, precision medicine has been the area of, of large academic medical centers, you know, folks, you know, organizations that have the wherewithal to manage these, these challenges we've been talking about. Do you think it, it will eventually filter down and, and be more commonplace in, in smaller uh, hospitals and health systems? Absolutely. It has to be, right? It has to be scalable to um, everybody out there for it to have impact. Um, and I, the way I look at it is sort of like the Tesla model, right? Like, and I, you know, Tesla started out with one of the most expensive cars in the world. Uh, but now they've come down to the price point where more and more consumers are able to use it, right? 
Now, it's still not at a point that everyone can afford a Tesla, but it's certainly much better than it was when it was 10 years ago, right? And as you've done that, you've exploded the electric vehicle market, right? And now other people are coming in, trying to make cheaper and better and faster. That's great. The more people you've in the pool trying to do this, the better it is for patients. And the same thing with precision medicine, AI, all that kind of stuff as a whole global scenario is the more players in the system that are working on it, improving it, making it better, the more people will benefit. Initially, maybe just academic centers or specialized centers that are using it. However, that knowledge and technology that's developed there then can be spread to a lot more people and impact healthcare as a whole system. What are some preparations that, uh, you know, viewers of this video who, who work at hospitals, you know, could be making now with regard to staffing or, te or technology or just, you know, kind of laying the groundwork to, to find success when this stuff becomes more of a reality? Yeah, so I think the first step is education for ourselves, right? What does it mean to do precision medicine, right? And that, I think, is the first step because precision medicine is this sort of black box term that people are like, that's a fancy tool. I can't do it. It's too expensive. Um, and that, that used to be true, but now I think we can educate ourselves on what does precision medicine mean? It actually means better care for the patient, personalized care for the patient, and tailored to their specific needs. We should be doing that for everybody, right? And what does it mean, though, in terms of combining technology and that kind of stuff? Can we first get the genetic test that people need? Can we then get, uh, or the lab test, not just genetic, but lab test? And then can we put that into the EMR? What does that mean? Uh, and then can we then interpret the results of that test in a meaningful, meaningful way for the person taking care of the patient, right? Just having a lot of, you know, what I call HTML code in there with um, uh, uh, just jargon and stuff doesn't help the clinician in real time. But you have to put it in a way that you take the data, raw data, and convert it to meaningful knowledge and present it to them in a way that uh, they can use it for the patient in real time in, in not just... Uh, you know, in Monday morning quarterbacking, but actually with the patient at that time. Any, any closing thoughts or, or things that I haven't asked you that you think are important to note? So I think, you know, physician medicine, you asked a lot of great questions. And I'll just add that I think this is a concept that uh, is still relatively new, requires some upkeep and structure. However, the potential for the benefit for the patient and for all of us involved in healthcare is so huge that we have to keep at it. And we can't give up, right? Just 10 years ago, people said electric vehicles, can't happen. It's like trying to go to the moon. It will never happen. Ten years later, everyone's talking about them. It's the front, you know, it's like the frontline technology in automobiles. This is the frontline technology in healthcare that can benefit all of our patients. We just have to get there in a meaningful way. It's going to be exciting to watch. Well, this has been a terrific conversation. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today.